In today's history lesson, we're going to talk about Mexican bourbon. Now, Mexican bourbon, if you've been following American whiskey, you probably know by now that a Mexican bourbon, well, it's not a thing because bourbon must be made in the United States. And if you have a free trade agreement with this country, then you must adhere to our standards and identity of what bourbon is, which means you can't make it in your country. And of course, we have a free trade agreement with Mexico, or kind of. Uh, so prior to Prohibition, there was a family called the Dowlings, or named the Dowlings, and they worked to move their facilities to Juarez, Mexico, where they put their Kentucky skills to work south of the border, and they were making Mexican bourbon. This is a bottle. I've actually consumed this bottle, it was, it was disgusting. It was absolutely disgusting to even think about it now. Even gives me the gross chills. Ugh. But it tasted like brute cologne. Yeah. How did I? Have I ever tasted brute cologne? Well, you put aftershave on when you're uh, in the army, and you tell me if you don't end up tasting some of it at some point. But anyway. So Waterfield and Fraser was making Mexican bourbon in Juarez, Mexico. They were actually even able to import it into the United States under the medicinal clause. The, the governments were running out of domestic whiskey, so they started importing things like rum and brandy and Mexican bourbon. So even after the 1930s and 40s and 50s, they kept making Mexican bourbon. Now, Canada tried to make Canadian bourbon, even though they were a strong, proud uh, whiskey country with their own styles of whiskey. But the gov U.S. government actually had some leverage on them and started like, uh, you know, using tariffs and various trade wars to block them from making Canadian bourbon, as well as using bottled and bond in their whiskeys. So Canada, although they could have pressed it forward, decided to say, well, you know what? We don't really need or care that much. We've got our own style of whiskeys. And then they make Crown Royal and, you know, they're looking back and laughing at the whole uh, thing about bourbon in the 1930s and 40s. But Mexico, on the other hand, they didn't really give two shits what the Americans thought. So they kept making Mexican bourbon. And it was in the 1950s and 1960s that the U.S. distillers, especially in Kentucky, had said, we've had enough. No more of this Mexican bourbon coming into the market and sullying the good name of bourbon. Because even then they thought the stuff tasted like crap. But here's the thing it's what they did is that this bourbon came into the market and undercut the market. So they would come in and sell for quite a bit less than what a good bottle of Kentucky bourbon would sell for. As people were trying to uh, lobby for a to make bourbon a unique product of the United States, there it was becoming increasingly clear that Mexico was going to lose its right to make bourbon. And in 1964, as they were about to pass the special declaration that made bourbon a unique product of the United States, there was one congressman who stood up and tried to block it. His name was James Lindsay. He ended up being a very important person in the civil rights movement, and he was later the, the mayor of New York. But he knew some of the shareholders of the Mexican distillery, and he tried to fight for them. He lost, but he managed to block bourbon from passing to become a unique product of the United States on April 30th, 1964. It would be passed a few days later, and today we celebrate that resolution as basically the when bourbon became a special product in the United States. To this day, it's the only liquid that is protected by our government and respected by other, other governments around the world. With that said, Mexican bourbon, that distillery, which had a lot of pride, and it actually did have a nice market for it, it, um, it ended up folding. And their parts and pieces and their stills would be chopped up and, you know, moved and sold throughout the country. You can see one of the stills that was used at that operation at the Willett Distillery, that nice column still that Willett has. 
is a former water fill in Fraser. Now, you are seeing a resurgence of Mexican whiskey, but they are not trying to call it bourbon. They're proud, and they're calling it Mexican whiskey, as they should. And that'll do it for this week's piece of history. If you want to make sure you're catching up and staying in tune with the history of bourbon and other spirits, make sure you're hitting that subscribe button. I also got a lot of fun tastings coming up. And check out my books, Whiskey Women and Bourbon, The Rise, Fall, and Rebirth of American Whiskey, if you want to learn more about the history of this great spirit. Until next week, cheers!